Thank you. That was part of the deal for me coming here. As I said, I'm not going to talk if you don't call me your royal highness. So I'm going to take my, uh, my, my selfie. <laughs> All right. So what is this thing and what does it do? I love, I love uh, proposing this talk to conferences because they're usually like, what the fuck is he talking about? Um, I, use bad, I had to check whether bad language was uh, part of the code of conduct, and indeed it is not, so fuck it. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> so the slides here, dom.carlgrovesandbox.com. I'm on Twitter at Carl Groves, uh, GitHub Carl Groves. Every social network, I'm on Carl Groves. There is a guy named Carl Groves from the United Kingdom who's a bodybuilder. That's not me, as you can see. So, uh, so you might be confused if there's like a whole bunch of fitness shit. It's, that's not me. Liberal politics and accessibility is, is what I'll t talk about. Okay. What is this thing? And what does it do? It's a button. And you click it and it does what? Searches. What is that? What does it do? Nothing, right? So the hypertext reference with the pound sign, anybody know what that pound sign is? Hash mark? It's a fragment identifier separator. What does a fragment identifier separator do? Developers think it does nothing. <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about some of that stuff. But so calling it a button and styling it like a button doesn't make it a button. Adding JavaScript so it acts like a button doesn't make it a button. And if you're really cool, you know Aria, and you add a roll of button, that doesn't make it a button either. Uh, so from the Microsoft UX guide, uh, if, is, the com is the command button used to in initiate an immediate action? If not, use another control. So now I want to talk about the DOM and accessibility. Uh, first thing I'm going to tell you, though, is accessibility is ridiculously boring. Oh my god, accessibility is boring, and it's going to make my website ugly. And if we can see in the background of the, this background picture is an old design of the ADA.gov website, which pretty much substantiates the argument that accessibility is ugly. And so we give all you uh, developers piles of requirements. We have policies and procedures and standards and laws and rules. We want to bury you under a whole bunch of documentation. So the WCAG 2.0 specification is 36 pages when you print it. The BS8878, which is a British standard for procurement uh, that deals with accessibility, that's 46 pages when it's printed. Now, how to meet WCAG 2.0, that's 44 pages printed. Understanding WCAG 2.0, 230 pages printed. Techniques and failures for WCAG, 780 pages printed. It's approximately 400 techniques and failures, and uh, these slides are a little bit out of date. A friend of mine and I decided to figure out how much that weighed. Like if we were to print this out in actual paper, reams of paper, and it is roughly equivalent to the amount of shit produced by a sheep in a given day. <laughs> so instead, I want to teach you guys one thing. I want you to remember only one thing. Always ask yourself, what is this thing and what does it do? Okay, so I want to go back a little bit in time to, uh, to at least, uh, I don't know, early days of, of uh, the web and talk to you about that M in the hypertext markup language. So hypertext markup language, if you look at the, the, the picture in the back of this slide, it's actually a letter press with all the letters. The term markup was derived from the traditional practice of make, marking up a manuscript which involves adding handwritten annotations in the form of conventional symbolic printer's instructions in the margins and text of paper, manuscript, or printed proof. Uh, the, the, the letterpress uh, dates back to the 13th century. And so HTML documents are SGML documents with generic semantics. One of the powers of the web and the proliferation of the web was the fact that HTML was so easy, right? Because we took all the craziness of SGML and Tim Berners-Lee created HTML, which was just a subset, had basic instructions for what, what uh, a, an HTML document would have. Uh, now, the first browser, as we know, was the World Wide Web browser uh, by Tim Berners-Lee. 
but it wasn't really until uh, 1993 when Mosaic came out that the web started taking off pretty crazily. Uh, anybody know why that was? Mosaic supported the image element. And as a matter of fact, from that point forward, we had what was called the browser wars, and that's where we saw whole piles of, of proprietary elements and attributes that were added to HTML that were not part of Tim's original specification. But we got to see stuff like applets, like holy crap, we can actually embed programs uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in our web page, base font, font, all that sort of stuff uh, eventually did, a lot of that stuff at least made it into the, to the HTML specification, but they were all proprietary. Image tag was not part of HTML in, in the beginning. We also started seeing JavaScript, and JScript, and CSS uh, getting added to all the, all the, the browsers. You know, uh, JavaScript became part of Netscape 4. Uh, that was huge, huge, huge. But then we needed a way to deal with all this stuff. We were extending the capabilities of the web in such a way that, that we, we were uh, making a mess of, of what would be supported on specific browsers. So that's when we saw, you know, best viewed in Netscape, best viewed in IE. And we needed a way of standardizing that, and that became the DOM. And so the DOM was the document object model, and it was a specification for dealing with representations of objects in the web, talking about what their, the methods and properties were. So really quickly, let's, let's uh, go back real quick for a diversion. What is this thing? Select element, right? So what does it do? You just click one and select it, right? No. HTML select element represents a control that presents a menu of options. The options within the menu are represented by option elements, which can be gr grouped by opt group elements. Options can be pre-selected for the user. Tab moves focus into the field. A second tab key selects the current item on the list, updates the field's value, closes the drop-down list, and moves focus to the next focusable element in the tab order. Alt, down arrow, and or space opens the drop-down list, moves focus to the selected option. If nothing is selected, then focus moves to the first option in the list. If the combo box is not editable, then the space bar may be used to open the drop-down list. Up and down arrow moves focus up and down the list. As focus moves inside the drop-down list, the edit field is updated. Enter selects the current item on the list, updates the value, highlights the selected item in the drop-down list, closes the drop-down list, and removes focus of the field. Escape key closes the drop-down list, returns focus of the field, and does not change the current selection. Typing a letter or any uh, principal character key moves focus to the next instance of visible node who title, whose title begins with that printable letter. Continuing to type continues this to complete behavior, and it also exposes these roles to assistive technology APIs. That's what that does. Anybody here ever make a, a custom select element? Did you do all that shit? <laughs> Why are you laughing? You didn't? So, uh, hey, y'all, watch this. That's uh, my family's from Kentucky, so. That's our equivalent to hold my beer. Yeah, so that's a, uh, if you want to use that brilliant piece of code there, that's chosen, jQuery plugin to tame unwieldy select boxes from the fine folks at Harvest. Now, I don't mean to, to browbeat Harvest. As a matter of fact, I use Harvest. I pay Harvest hundreds of dollars a month for my team. Love it, but that is a steaming pile of crap. That is a, supposed to be a custom select element, and to a person of assistive technologies, they cannot use that because it doesn't do all that stuff I said before. So this is where we get to talk about the DOM. So for those of you who are not too f terribly familiar with what the DOM is, it's a cross-platform and language independent convention for representing and interacting with objects. Objects in the DOM tree can be addressed and manipulated by using methods on those objects. And the public interface of a DOM is specified in its application programming interface. So classes, we're going to get into, <laughs> we'll get into some uh, object-oriented programming pr principles here because this is going to carry us forward uh, as we go on. Classes encapsulate uh, the conceptual representation of an object. An object is going to have a, me has methods, 
That's things that they can do. Properties are attributes that describe it. So for those of you who are not familiar with these concepts, think about a car as an object. It's gonna have methods like drive or turn or whatever, and then properties like what color it is and how many doors and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the important part, however, here is the interfaces. The interfaces define and the methods and properties that an object should have. An interface does not de define the object's implementation, and so in the case of a DOM, the browser vendors define the final implementation of those objects. So in other words, the DOM specification doesn't tell uh, Chrome or Firefox or whatever exactly what it must have, and it doesn't define how that stuff is going to work. It says, here's the, interface, here's the interface for this object. This is what you should do. The browser vendors are therefore free to ignore that advice uh, or to extend those methods or whatever, however they, they so choose. So this is a, an example of the most basic HTML element. Now, actually, if you go into the DOM specification, there's element, and then before element, there's node. So, but when we talk about an actual element that we can put in our, our, our HTML, this is like the DOM interface for like a span, okay? Something that does literally nothing. It's the most basic uh, object that you can put on there. And so that, uh, that extends the element, uh, the element object. So we're, we're, that's what that little arrow is. And then the, uh, the interface is defined as this. It has several attributes. The ID attribute, the title attribute, the lang, the dir, and the class name, and that's pretty much it. Now again, like I said, the browser vendors could do whatever the heck they want with that. So in, in the case of almost all browsers, they're gonna have a, a ton of other properties that they would, would put on this, this uh, item. Um, usually you'd, you'd see them as uh, prefixed, you know, like WebKit slash, or WebKit dash, whatever the heck it is. Um, but these, these are the base items that, uh, that this object should have. So this is a span. Okay, so if you make a button out of a span, this is actually what you have available to you in the DOM of the browser, that's it, these, these attributes. It has no methods at all. So, are these radio buttons? Well, we don't know, let's take a look. Uh, they look like radio buttons, cool. So let's take a look at what a radio button looks like. So the interface for an HTML input element, that's the object uh, that is created when you create a radio button that extends HTML element. Now, because it extends HTML element, it, has, it, it inherits from its parent all the attributes that it had before, and then it adds these other attributes, default value, default checked, uh, read-only attribute, HTML form element, which is the, the, the form that, it rela that uh, this thing corresponds to, other attributes here, and then there are, uh, there should be, a, there's, a, there's a method here for, for um, blur. There's a blur method on there. So this adds a, a method uh, to that type of object. So again, we, we're extending the behavior of that object uh, through these additional attributes and properties. So what does a radio button do? So when, uh, with a radio button, users make a single choice among a set of mutually exclusive related options. Users can choose one and only one option. So let's take a look at this video. So this is uh, this is from a, uh, a plugin called Pretty Checkable, and what they did that was really cool is they. Um, they um, use real radio buttons uh, in the background and, and they use CSS to sort of position those, the, the existing radio button off there. And you can use any image that you want for these, uh, for these radio buttons. Uh, so you can make a custom radio button look however you want. So we would think from, from listening to that and watching that, we would think these are accessible, right? Because the screen reader told us you know, which ones were selected, how many options we had, all that sort of stuff. We were able to arrow between those just like we would with radio buttons. What don't we see? We don't see the selection because the developers tied this to the click event and not the, and not the, the selected state of that, of that item. So again, we've created a custom control where we've forgotten uh, exactly how that thing should work. That radio buttons, we, we would be arrowing through those things. So if I go back to this, 
and, and I see this, now I'm, I'm on this section here. If I hit, well, if I hit the arrow button, I go to the next slide because that's how this works, but I should be able to arrow between these things. So that's what this looks like behind the scenes. If you're used to looking at uh, Chrome DevTools, you'll notice that the, the, the grayed out part here is because that thing is marked as display none. Uh, and so then but they, what they've done is they've substituted this janky little link that does nothing to position their, their radio button on there. So the way, the relationship between the DOM and the user interface painted on the screen and the accessibility APIs is really, really important. Now this used to be exactly how uh, Firefox worked before they, when they started switching from Firefox 4 to Firefox 9 million, um, they, the, the object that got painted to the screen was the same exact system object that would get painted to the screen on a desktop application. So like in your print menu, when you would be like selecting the radio buttons in the print menu as to layout or landscape or whatever, um, Firefox would paint the exact same object on the screen. Uh, with one of the big changes that they made at Firefox 4 was that they started uh, to use a custom element, so a, cu a custom uh, object because it would allow predictability across, across the items. But anyway, what we see here is that what happens is the, 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 as the screen gets painted, it's going to also, it's gonna also uh, create objects that the accessibility APIs can read. So on the left-hand side here, we see the, the way the, user, the, the air section here for the user agent, that the browser DOM uh, is, is, is created from, from us uh, sending over the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. JavaScript is the controller. And so as, if you've ever inspected an object in the DOM, you'll see that there's shitloads of DOM properties, right? An accessibility API doesn't really care about all those things. The accessibility care, API cares about one thing. What is this thing and what does it do? So it's gonna care about what we call name, state, role, and value, okay? And so we have roles here, like what is it? Is it a checkbox, is it a radio button, is it a select element? What's it doing is its state? So it could be, if it's a radio button, it could be selected or unselected. It could be read only, it could be disabled. Uh, and then, of course, certain things about the DOM hierarchy and all that sort of stuff. And then that gets fed through to the assistive technology. So this whole support uh, and, and relationship between these things is really, really important. The browser has to support the accessibility API, and that accessibility API has to you know, talk to the assistive technology. Every single element in HTML is mapped to some sort of object in the accessibility API. Okay, so uh, if we're talking about uh, the second, second row here, which is, uh, I'm sorry, the first row, which is A, uh, that has a valid href attribute, is gonna represent a link role in ARIA, and that'll also uh, be cor have corresponding roles here in MSAA and iAccessible2. MSAA and iAccessible2 are Microsoft um, uh, uh, APIs. Then the AX, uh, the AX API is the Mac API. And so each one of these is gonna have some sort of uh, mapping to the accessibility API. So when you get to a button or a link or a radio button or whatever, that information gets conveyed to the user because we've done our job in our markup to convey what that stuff is. What is this thing? It's a horribly designed toolbar because I'm an accessibility guy. What are these things? What does it do? So uh, pay no attention to the fact that it's got a hype, that janky hypertext reference. I put that in there. But we see this a lot. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're used to Font Awesome or some other glyph uh, thing, you'll see this pattern of the I element being used for an icon. And it has a class name. And the class name uh, represents the, uh, the, the, the CSS class for uh, whatever that icon is. So these are all Unicode characters, or hopefully not anymore, hopefully they're SVG, uh, but either way, they're mapped to something that, that puts this on the screen. But what we see here is nothing. So if we were to inspect the text node of this element, there would be nothing in there. Even though we're trying to say this is home and this is favorites and that's Dropbox, I don't know. but. Uh, <laughs> 
either way, we see this, we understand immediately based on its, based on its uh, tokenized representation in our brain that this is what it is. Says literally nothing to an accessibility API. It doesn't represent any name in the accessible name calculation for that thing. It's literally nothing. <clears throat> So I said I wanted you to remember one thing, which is what is this thing and what does it do? I kind of actually want you to remember four. So when I talked about WCAG and I talked about how it's you know, 36 pages printed out, it's actually got a really sensible organization in its standards. And the first layer of organization are the principles. And the principles of WCAG are perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So if you look at, if you've ever seen, like if you've ever read the WCAG um, standard because you have insomnia, um, then you'll notice that there's like guidelines like 1.1.1, right? So 1.1.1 is the first success criteria in the first guideline under the first principle. So that's under perceivable. So perceivable is relating to the senses. And it's information and user interface components must be represented to users in ways they can perceive. So that's where we get into things like captioning and audio description and, uh, and, and uh, alt attributes for images and all that sort of stuff. Operable is that user interface components and navigation must be operable. So that means it can be operated effectively with not only just a mouse, but also touch and keyboard. Understandable is information and the operation of user interface must be understandable. So that's like where we talk about the relationships of, of content between each other, the use of good headings, uh, good labels, all that sort of stuff. And then robust is that it must be robust enough that it can be interpreted reliably by a wide variety of user agents, including assistive technologies. And so that's what I've been talking a lot about here is that robustness part is that the browser can interpret it properly enough that it can also be interpreted by the accessibility API so we can tell the user what is this thing and what does it do. So again, the, the, uh, this one is the 4.1.2, so it's the second success criteria in the first guideline on the fourth, uh, fourth principle here, which is a robust. So what do we call this thing? That's the name of the object. So if it's a form element, like a checkbox, it could be like, yes or no, right? So that's the name. Uh, the state is, what is it doing? So therefore, implicitly, what else can it do? So if it's a checkbox, it can be unchecked. If it's, uh, if it's a radio button, it can be selected, or the other one can be, that, that sort of stuff. Role is, what is it? Okay, so that's, that's again, if, if, it's, if it's a checkbox, it needs to be identified as a checkbox. Value, so what does it represent? Now that's only relevant for like actual controls, like form elements and stuff like that. Um, so what does this all mean? What we're really trying to get to is the principle of least astonishment. Anybody here knows who Cunningham, Cunningham and Cunningham are? Ward Cunningham, Ron Jeffries? All right, that's the one person to agile in the room. So, okay. So I stole this from the the, the their little wiki that they have. And it actually has to do with, with programming, but I like it for UX as well. That the, the result of performing some operations should be obvious, consistent, and predictable. Okay, UX and accessibility are primarily about ensuring that the user understands what the heck they're doing when they're there, how to, how to get the job done when they arrive at that part of the user interface. Uh, now, I'm not the only one saying this stuff. The Android developers design principles say if it looks the same, it should act the same. So I like this picture here because a lot of people point to this as something that's really awesome for accessibility. It's got a stramp and it very definitely is not good for accessibility. Imagine you're in a wheelchair and you're like, your wheel just, just goes a little bit over to one of these stairs. And then your ramp becomes stairs, okay. Um, so that's actually why I, I used it here, because if it looks the same, it should act the same. It's not a ramp, it's a death trap. Um, <laughs> now, if you're not an Android fan, you're more of an Apple fanboy like me, uh, then here you go. iOS human interface guidelines say consistency lets people transfer their knowledge and skills from one part of the app's UI to another, and from one app to another app. A consistent app isn't a slavish copy of other apps, and it isn't stylistically stagnant. Rather, it pays attention to the standards and paradigms that people are comfortable with, and it provides an internally consistent experience. The OSX 
human interface guidelines say, OSX user knows how to, see, how to use such standard user interface elements because we're smarter than Windows users, um, <laughs> regardless of the app in which they appear. If you're a super nerd and you use KDE, they say the same stuff. Every user interface guideline for every platform out there that you could ever imagine talks about consistency of, uh, and predictability of the user interface. In other words, ask yourself, what is this thing? What does it do? So when we talk about what is this thing, like what are the goals of the user? Why are they even here in the first place? Okay, and how are they gonna achieve those goals with our user interface? What are the goals of the business? Because I don't know about you guys, but my business is in the business of making money. Uh, I still don't have my Ferrari yet, which pisses me off. Um, how would this UI element contribute to both goals, right? I mean, seriously, when we're making a user interface design decision, we need to think about contributing to both of those goals. Making the user happy makes them give us money, and that satisfies the goals of the, of the business, too. Um, how is this user and UI element better for the user than competing options? As a matter of fact, as a consultant, when I have a customer going, hey, how do I make this thing accessible? Usually the first thing I ask them is, how is that thing better than all of the other options that you have on the table? I had a customer one time, they do a time tracking app for, for, uh, for, for like, um, uh, like they do punch cars and all, but they also have service employees have a special app on their, on their, uh, uh, on their phone that they can use. And, they, and it has dialogues that open up dialogues with tab panels that open up dialogues and I'm like, they're like, how do we make this accessible? And I'm like, throw it away. Because that's not the best option for all of the other, that's not the best way you know, when we measure all the other options that we could use. What does it do? So how does it operate via the mouse? How does it operate via the keyboard? If you can do something with the mouse on this thing, you need to be able to do it with the keyboard across the board. Doesn't matter what it is. Because lots of people can't see the mouse pointer or they can't operate the mouse reliably. How is focus? managed to, through, and from this UI control. This part, the to part is easy. Most people get that right. It's the through and the from that really gets people messed up. I did uh, work on unfucking the healthcare.gov website, and one of the things that they had was there was an application process that you would, when you started applying for health insurance, Step one, enter your information, and the, the, a couple of fields would show up, you know, your name and all that sort of stuff. Step two, enter your employee and from, you know, where you work and all that stuff. So when we'd go from step one, the accordion would, step one to step two, the accordion would, would close, and then focus would disappear. Like programmatic focus would just totally disappear because we didn't think about how focus would, would come out of that. So if we're doing a multi-step process, focus has to be managed through the entire process, and they didn't think about that stuff. What happens when the user acts upon the control? Is it predictable? Is it the kind of action that people are used to doing with that kind of control, right? And, and, and uh, is that represented? So if your control exists, then use it, right? And, if, and, and that's the big lesson is if the control you want to use exists, use it. We don't need to program custom stuff because, because uh, we, we uh, want to. So, Yes, it exists, but the support sucks, right? So lots of the HTML, new HTML input types, like a, a color picker or something like that, that, that doesn't enjoy terribly great uh, support across browsers. Use progressive enhancement. In the previous uh, talk, we heard about feature detection. Detect whether that's, that input type is supported. Use it, and if not, then, then you need to replace it with something custom. If styling is hard, give the designer a wedgie. <laughs> okay, yeah, actually, I, I gotta say, then we also need to give browser vendors a wedgie too. Because a large portion of accessibility problems on the web are caused by people wanting a custom style for form controls and stuff like that, and the form controls can't be styled. So, so it's sort of a shared responsibility. Like if the designer is really looking for something crazy, then they definitely deserve a wedgie. If, they, if they're just looking for something that's, that's nice and consistent, then we need to give the browser vendors a wedgie because we're doing all this cool shit on supporting all these nifty things like service workers on the web, but we still can't style elements that should have been styled back in 1999. If not, then you're screwed. 
No, actually, Wei Arya is your friend. So this is where we get into Wei Arya. Now, the first rule of Arya is not to use Arya unless you absolutely have to. If the control exists and can be styled reliably, then you need to use it. We don't want to supplement uh, our, our, um, our application with, with a whole bunch of Arya crap all over the place if we don't really need it. Um, it's intended to be a bridging technology. It's not appropriate uh, to create objects with style and script when the host language provides that. So here we see a native date picker uh, supported by Chrome, and then we see like the use of some UI uh, um, library for supplementing that for, for browsers that don't support it. The thing to keep in mind about Aria is it does not do anything. Actually, I say Aria is a lie. Remember when you were a little kid and like your mom would lecture you about lying? Like, don't lie, because then you have to tell another lie, and then you have to tell another lie to back up that lie. That's what Aria does, is all about lying to your user. It helps to provide predictability to the controls, but it doesn't do anything else, okay? So you're conveying that name, state, role, and value stuff, but it doesn't change the object. If you were to inspect the constructor of something that you've created, out of ARIA, it's still going to have the constructor from whatever the elements that you created that out of. So you're still on the hook to make it perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. You're still on the hook to maintain state and all that sort of stuff. So I put this slide on every single presentation I do. First off, because I love the Louvre in France. It's, that's what this picture is. It's the, the Louvre Museum in France. Um, what I really like about it, though, is that it, that it really represents what I like to talk about when I talk about uh, design and, and all that sort of stuff, which is that good design is the convergence between creativity and capability. So this is the elevator in the Louvre. Uh, so at, up at the very top, there's, we also see it. It's not just the elevator, it's the staircase, because half of you are probably going, dude, that is not an elevator. <laughs> at the very top here, very, very top, if you can see my mouse pointer, that's the stairs. That's where you enter when you're walking in. Now imagine I'm at the stairs. There's also this other spot here where it enters the, uh, the elevator. So you, you're basically, if you're in a wheelchair, you wheel into this, to this elevator right there in the middle next to your friend. And you go down, and you're walking down, and your friend, Professor X, is waiting for you at the bottom. And you walk out next to each other as well. So we don't make the person in the wheelchair go to the other side of the frickin' museum to get in there. They go in the same spot, they exit the same spot right next to everybody else. So good design is the convergence between creativity and capability. I'm Carl Groves. Uh, that's all my information. Thank you.